Hello, everyone. You know, I thought it would be a good time uh, to do uh, a live video of an Atmos mix. Now, I did a last one again, which was based on Taikudam with just um, Chatte. And uh, that was a few years back. And I think there's a lot more changes that has happened, uh, both in the way we work um, in, in the entire tools for Dolby Atmos, um, how you work with it in the box, uh, or if you want to deliver for like, for example, home Atmos. And there are a lot of um, very, very good tutorials out there. You know, there's, there's some really interesting ones on the Avid channel. You know, Dolby has some really, really good videos. Uh, but what I wanted to do with this particular um, video was to show you how I personally approach uh, a mix in surround um, to show you some of the techniques that I use. Uh, and also it's very important to know that, you know, it's not about plugins. It's not about, uh, you know, what I use. It's more about how I use it and why I use it. There's a lot of things in this that is completely unconventional um, that probably makes very little sense if if you were to do it purely for stereo. And that's why I wanted to bring out uh, this video as well. Because one of the most important things that we'll get to understand is the philosophy of how you mix in Atmos. Because the truth is, there is no rule. Um, there are certain things that you need to take care of when you do in, when you mix in Atmos, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, but the primary thing is, you know, is to let it let your creativity drive the mix first and uh, tell a story. That's very important. the The approach to every mix should be that you should be able to tell a story, and um, that's again one of the things that I intend to do with this. Now, this song is from '96. Um, composed by uh, Govind. It's very well produced. Um, you know, it's got some really fantastic progressions and it's a very interesting song. It is a big hit as well. Uh, so this is one of the songs that I want to show you um, the approach in if you were to get a song that was stereo and how would you approach uh, mixing it in Atmos. Now, there are a few ground rules to this. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm using a Dolby Atmos renderer here. So I'll, I'll quickly explain how Atmos is and how it functions. Um, this won't be an in-depth uh, video about that because this whole setup and a lot of this is explained very well in, in other tutorials as well. So this is, uh, this is the screen if you are mixing for Atmos because it's important to remember that one of the functions, you know, Atmos does exist for music. But one of the functions is that Atmos is also something that's meant for cinema or for like a uh, for a visual uh, impact, visual based storytelling technique. So if you look at how you position this, so this is a screen, and you'll notice there are no speakers, and that is one of the best things that I really uh, like about Atmos is you are no longer mixing to speakers; you are mixing to a space, and when you mix to a space. You know, the constraint of, you know, having to mix with a certain number of speakers or a certain set of speakers that is positioned in a very particular way is actually taken off. There are no constraints. And that means that you are truly mixing to what you as an engineer or the music director or the, or the creative artist in, in each one of you feels is immersive. And that is very important because this is primarily an immersive media. Now, granted that we won't be able to hear this in Dolby Atmos because YouTube doesn't stream Dolby Atmos. But what I've set up in this is I've set this up to um, to play back in, in, in a binaural way. So hopefully that translates. Um, I'm not sure how, how the codex would treat it. But um, anyways, so this is the simplest form of Atmos. You have a bed. A bed is basically uh, all the signals that go to left, center, right, left, surround, right, surround, left, back, right, back. The left, top combined. This LTF means left, top, front, and LTR means left, top, rear. But this is combined as left, top, and this is combined as right, top. That's a bed. So you have 10 tracks in a bed. Everything below that is an object. Now, what exactly is an object? So an object is something that you would use in a way to pan with much more precision. So imagine this was a movie theater. 
Now, in a movie theater, you have a left speaker and you have an array of speakers. So, you know, it wouldn't be one speaker here. You would have a few speakers that would make up left surround, for example. So if I were to pan something from left to left surround, you know, it would jump from one speaker to an array of speakers. Um, but if I use it as an object, I can actually address every single speaker that is set up in this format. That's the renderer. This is what is, you know, sending the output to what we want to hear. And this is the Pro Tools session. So there are two steps that you need to follow. One is in you have a peripheral setup where you need to, if you go to the Atmos tab, you need to enable and connect to the Atmos renderer. And that's it. Once you have that, Pro Tools knows there is an Atmos renderer in the network. <clears throat> so if this was for cinema, that would be a different machine and that is running. Or even if, if you're running like a high-end um, mix room for home entertainment, you know, you have an external renderer and just has to be on the same network. So that's the first step. The second step is, you know, telling Pro Tools where the objects are and where they are mapped to. So you can see I have these uh, objects that are mapped to all of these outputs here. It specifically knows that, okay, object 1, 2 is mix MX object 1, 2 that goes out of le output 11 and 12. Now, output 11 and 12 in the renderer is this one, 11 and 12. And you can see that it is also assigned to an object, uh, mapped to an object. Now, the reason you do this is so that Pro Tools will send signals from here. So the way Pro Tools tells the renderer is saying, hey, I'm sending you signals through output 11 and 12 but I'm also sending you the pan information that is related to that. So, but you have to be very careful because if you set this to, let's say, um, 11 and 12, and you set this to 13 and 14, you know, it'll send audio out of 11 and 12, but the pan information will be for 13 and 14. So it won't pan. You know, it's like having one track in Pro Tools and, you know, you're panning the other track, you know, it doesn't make sense. Right. And, you know, you can get much more details about this in, in a lot of tutorials that are there as well. So, uh, I'll just quickly play um, a, a small section and then I'll break this down into how I've set this up and how this has been arranged. So uh, the song progresses uh, from there on and on. Now, uh, we are working on Pro Tools 2020 and I've organized everything into folders. Um, you should definitely, definitely check out folder tracks in Pro Tools. It's pretty rad. So, you know, there are two kinds of folder tracks. There's a routing folder track and there's a basic folder track. Uh, for this case, I've used all of them. I've just compiled all of them into basic folder tracks. And just this is just purely for organizational purposes. 
So I'll, I'll take you through through the tracks. Um, I always, always work with VCAs. So, you know, if I have a set of stems, so if you look at this, I have percussions, loops, strings, piano, guitar, synth, vocals. And all of these um, are, are VCAs um, and they all control these individual sections. So, for example, the, the percussion VCA controls all of these tracks. Um, the... The loop VCA controls everything over here and so on and so forth. Uh, what I also have, I also have a music VCA. Now, the reason I do this is because I use the music VCA to control everything but the vocals. Um, that's something I keep in as, as a safety factor as well, you know, because if, if the song gets really busy, it's much more easier to slightly write the music under the vocals so that you have a bit more vocal clarity rather than trying to, uh, you know, f you know, do a lot of EQ compression against the music. So that's, again, that's just a safety thing that I keep in, you know, uh, in, in this one, I haven't um, really, really done any rides in that. So the way uh, this is all routed for now is I have all of my percussions going to a percussions bus. The percussions bus comes to this aux, and this one goes to my mix bus. So this is where I have... Um, the mix bus come in, which goes to a submix, and this output finally goes to a main output, which is here. Now, initially, the percussions and on all of these outputs went straight off to the final mix bus. But what I wanted to do at, at one point was I wanted to do a bit of parallel processing to the entire song, you know, in, in, in pockets, and I'll, I'll explain the reason why as well as we get there. But because I wanted to do parallel processing, I couldn't send it directly to this bus. So I sent it to uh, kind of a submix bus and I duplicated that and both of these are now going back to my uh, mix bus over here. The final mix bus. And I'll explain this routing as we get there. So we have percussions, we have loops, we have the bass, we have strings, pads, piano, we have guitars, we've got the synths, we've got some vocals, some choruses. It's so well arranged and you know it's so well produced as well as you can as you heard it. Now if you look if you listen to this song, this song actually starts with, with a very simple piano. The original panning for this one was, you know, it's it's a left-right piano. You know, it's it's just a straight off left right piano. But what I wanted to do was, you. I wanted a song to start and bloom up, you know. So one of the things that I did was, I have this piano, it starts off in the dead center. Now, I could have easily just opened up the pan, you know, like for example, I could hit play and as it, as it opens up, I could, I could have done this for the piano. But I chose to do a slightly different technique. And what I chose to do was, so I have the piano that's playing in mono, I duplicated the original PN track. So this is the original track and I just edited this much off and then put it into a duplicate track. And on the original piano track, I've inserted the new gen Halo. The, one of the best things that I really love about Halo is that it gives you an up mix into 7.1 or 7.1.2. Uh, you know, you can have a control of, of the amount of um, information that should go to the high channels, you know, how much should spread should it diffuse, you know, all of those things are highly controllable. So when I did this, you get something that starts in the center and truly blossoms up into a 712. So if you if you look this uh, in the um, in the Dolby Atmos renderer, you will see how how this information changes channels. So for example, if I were to play that, You can actually hear it, you know, bloom in, even in your headphones, you know, when you sit and listen to this. So that's that's one of the things that I do. And it's a very simple technique, you know, there's not a lot of fader movements, there's not a lot of wacky rides and nothing of that sort. Um, there's just slight faders that are kept just for the sake of balancing between this track to this track. So that's a trick that I, that I do quite often um, as well. Now... 
um, if I so that's I mean, the piano doesn't have a lot of um, things in that, but there are some other very interesting processings that happen downstream. Uh, before that, uh, let me uh, let me see what uh, what we've done for the percussions here. And uh, let me if I solo the percussions, and this is actually pretty rad as well. You can just solo the, the folder, and you know the end everything that's part of the folder is now soloed in this case. So let's if I look at the percussion, this is what. So that's the kick. Um, one thing I very often do with the kick is, you know, I, I rarely, I actually never keep the kick in, in this manner. And one of the reasons for that is I want the energy to be spread across the stage. You know, the left, center, right together is the stage. So if you look at, if you look at this, you have left, center, right. And for a person sitting and experiencing this, he won't, he does, he should not be bothered about a left, center or right channel. You know, it should be a stage. So I want to, you know, distribute the energy equally um, within those. So that's why I kind of, I tend to keep it, you know, roughly in, in this position. And you can actually hear the difference as well. The kick just kind of smears out versus, you know, having a focus towards the center. So that's one thing that I usually do with the kick. Uh, what do I have on the kick? It's, it's a simple Pro Q3. Uh, usually I have uh, some some of these in, in dynamic mode. So I tend to keep the low ends in dynamic mode just to get a bit more, um, better control over the um, low end of the kick. So if I were to... So you can, you can hear there's a bit of control over the low end. That's one thing. And the other one is I use the, the very common uh, pull, uh, technique with the pull tech. So uh, if you're not aware of this, this is a very um, interesting technique that you can do on the pull tech, wherein you boost and cut uh, for the low frequencies, you boost and cut at the same, um, at the same level on the same frequency. What this gives you is it gives you a very interesting shape um, at the low end, and it kind of it kind of adds a bit more body than a regular EQ. Let's you know if I bypass this and I'll enable this, and you can hear the difference as well. It's it's subtle, but um. It, it definitely is a difference. Now, I'm not sure if the YouTube um, streaming codec will let you hear that much of a difference, but that difference uh, definitely does exist. And the other main uh, interesting area where that change makes a difference is in the LFE. So I, I make sure my LFE tracks go through a subharmonic processor. And the reason for that is simple. If I simply open up a send, so I'm essentially sending whatever is in this track you know, as it is to the LFE, right? Now, traditionally, you would not want the high frequency elements in your subwoofer. So what would you do? You would put a filter. Now, you would usually put, say, a filter at um, 120 hertz, right? And most of the times uh, I've seen that, like, even I used to do that mistake very often, is that you put a filter and I leave it to, um, uh, you know, um, 18 dB per octave. You know, it's just a simple filter that you can put, like a uh, low pass filter and you you I put it to 120 hertz and I cut off at 18 dB per octave. Now there is something that's very interesting. Whenever you add filters, you know there's roughly um, I mean the, the, you will you will end up having phase shift. Now if you look at this stage here, so you have left center right, and your subwoofer is going to be in this region. So if you consider the kick, you are sending it to left center, right? And you're sending the full signal to the LFE as well. If you have phase issues between these channels, they will definitely show up and in the area of 120 hertz. Uh, because the reason is when you put a filter, you will have a phase shift of uh, 45 degrees per 6 dB octave. So if you, if you start putting a filter... Uh, so 6 dB octave will have 45, 50, 45 degrees, 12 dBs will be 90 and so on and so forth. By the time you hit 24 dB per octave, you will end up with 180 degrees of phase shift. You know, if if we're talking about a Butterworth filter. Um, so with one, 180 degrees of phase shift, you know, at 
the corner frequency, which is 120 hertz, what will happen is you will end up um, having. So, you know, if if I were to show you that, so let's say, um, yeah, so let's just take a one band over here. And if I put this to 120 and I put it as a low pass. So if I put this to 24, what will happen is at 120 hertz, the signal will actually be 180 degrees out of phase, you know. And that signal is the exact same signal that is there in this track. Right? We're not doing any processing. So I don't do that anymore. What I do is I send it to a sub to the LFE track. And on the LFE, I create an LFE master and I insert the pro sub harmonic. Because if you logically think about it, um, the reason these would cancel is because, you know, A, they are the same signal and B, they are the same level. Or, you know, ideally, even if they're not the same level, you know, you would still have some kind of a phase interaction. But what this pro sub harmonic does is it actually uh, adds harmonics to that. So it is no longer uh, this in the same phase relationship. It's actually an extension of that. In fact, the, you know, one of the ways this works is like it creates an exactly half. So, for example, if you if you are at 60 to 90, you can see this is 30 and 45 hertz. If you're 80 to 120. So this is exactly half of each one of this. So it takes half the cycle and creates um, the extended low from there. In this way, I am guaranteed that, you know, I will not have a, um, a phase issue between my, my main channel and my LFE. And... I can choose to have the mix blend in, you know, in how much ever I want. So this is, um, I went a bit long, but this is a technique that I use very often with um, with the LFE. Right. So what he has is he's got an additional kick as well. So that kind of just adds up a little bit more uh, uh, bottom end to it. And then, you know, it comes in with that and the snare. Now on on the on the snare toms, I've you know just I just wanted to get a lot more of the transients uh, cut through as well. Um, you can also see the the pan positions that they are in. Now, one thing that I did in this was um, I duplicated this track, which you can see here. Uh, I had the same uh, transient on that. What I also have is I've got the Event Tide twenty sixteen. Um, this is a very interesting uh, technique um, that uh, I learned from Alan Myerson. Um, so one of the things you can do in this is um, you have a front and the rear position. So what I do is, you know, ideally you would you would have the mix at you know hundred percent wet, and I move this completely to the rear. What that gives me is a slight more diffusion for the snare, because a snare has a lot of transient elements in it. Now, if I were to take something that has a lot of transient elements and I start panning it to the to the surrounds, I would instantly hit timing issues, you know, because the way these speakers are calibrated, are, you know, if you see yourself, you're sitting here. Now, the speaker that is along this plane will hit you before the speakers from here. So there is a, so to compensate for that, you have a timing difference between the surround speakers and the front speakers. Now, if I were to do that, and if I were to put a transient element within um, within this, what would happen is uh, there would be a timing issue between these two. So I I, time, I tend to, you know, roll off the transients. So in this case, you know, when I heard it, just the, the, the event type does that for me as well. So this is what I would hear. You can hear a slight um, opening up. It's not very apparent in the headphones, but you, this actually opens up more towards the surround channels um, as well because this is completely panned towards the back. So that gives me a bit more opening up for the snare toms, you know, without going um, towards processing direct reverbs on these. So if I listen to the percussion as it, you can see... And you can you can hear the slight um, air that this creates. Now, uh, to be honest, um, you know this all sounds good in isolation, but when the moment you start adding the other elements, you know a lot of these subtleties might get lost. Uh, so I I use a few techniques to get that in, but I don't. Um, uh, you know, every person has their own approach towards a mix. So you know, if if that subtlety means a lot, 
I will definitely try and you know try my best to make that heard. But if not, you know, I tend to not spend a lot of time in getting a subtlety out because the idea of the mix is it has to be organic. And you know, if that subtlety is something that can be heard at a point when it needs to be heard, then it's fine. You know, I don't need to hear that subtlety all throughout the song as well. Um, then we have the symbols. Uh, so the symbols, I have a bit more, bit of um, transient attack on that, and I also have the um, the uh, the Lindel plugin. Again, this is from Plugin Alliance, and if you're not on the Mega subscription, you should definitely get on the Mega subscription. Some of the plugins on this, I wouldn't say some, all of the plugins on this are fantastic plugins. You know, they're like really really good so i use the te100 because i really like some of the um the boost it does on the on the hf uh, signal so if you if i were to bypass this and we hear the symbol here now if i enable that you can hear the the air that this brings in you know and you know right so uh so if we were to listen to this section here this is how it would sound Fairly straightforward, you know, uh, uh, nothing majorly happening there in terms of action. Um, but there is a section here that comes up. And what happens here is this is what it does. You know, it sounds good in, in all of this, but at this section, if you look at what's happening down the track, it is quite heavy. You know, there's 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 a far, there's far more far more elements that are going to play there. So one of the techniques that you can do when you want something to be heard in a busy um, environment is to change the position of it. So what I have there is a pan man, and what the pan man is doing is it's basically just moving the um, the the shaker across, and this is how it sounds like. And that's actually far more interesting than if it was, um, you know, a static position. Because it, it gives it gives a bit more movement um, to the song. Um, uh, there's also another place where this exact technique comes up. And that's for the tambourines over here. It's again, I have a pan man that's going into a um, high pass filter. And uh, I'm using again the mag. EQ from Plugin Alliance. The, the you know one of the very interesting things about the Mag is the air bang, and it sounds really nice. Um, it can go up to 40k. So you know if you're doing a project in let's say for example 96k, um, you need to have high sample rate in your audio, and when you're mixing at 96k, you know as you know your frequency elements go all the way up to 48k if if they exist, especially in your harmonic processing. Um, it might not be there in the original recording, or it may be there, but your harmonic processings can go really high. And, you know, at that, at that point, all of these air bands, you know, they make a huge difference as well. So um, this is how it sounds with the tambourines. Now, I did the pan only on the tambourines and not on the cymbals. Uh, because the thing with the cymbals is it's meant to be more like something that's filling that entire spectrum. So if if you have the very high tambourines moving across just to give you a sense of movement, uh, I wouldn't want to have the cymbals move as well. Because one thing you should keep in mind in mixing is, you know, uh, less is more. So you pick and choose what you want to move and if you want to move it, you know, you have to have a very valid reason to be able to move that as well. So once you do that, then make sure that, you know, those movements are, are, are nice and defined. So that's where the uh, the point where I said of something that is um, where you have something that is subtle and you want to work with it in your session. Now, we could do one thing. Let's say um, I wanted to have... Um, uh, this one uh, to be part of my screen wides, for example. Now, the screen wides would be somewhere around here. Let's see, I can assign it to an object. Okay, I don't have a free object. Let me just make a, 
a few objects for us. Uh, I come to my bus. Let's make um, three stereo. I'll auto create that. That. Now I have to name these as well. So there's a there's a very interesting uh, uh, application that I use, uh, which is Soundflow. You can do a lot of magic with it. You should definitely check it out. Um, it's called Soundflow. So I have to start at 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. So let's come back to Soundflow and I run this and I, I call it object. And I start at 15 and I end at 20. This is what it does. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So um, now that I have these, I'm going to select these. I'm going to assign them to 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And I need to assign them to my objects as well. Yeah. So now we've got our objects. I'm just going to hit OK as well. Right. So I assign that to this object. And what I can do is I can also toggle this. So there is one very interesting thing that we have with an object and it's called a speaker snap. Now, what a speaker snap does is when I position this at this point, that position is usually called a screen wide. Uh, so if you were to look at the surround channels that start from somewhere around here, there is a gap in this point. Uh, in Atmos, you have a speaker here, one or two, depending on how big the area is. Now, this range is called a screen wide because it's kind of wide away from the screen. So in order to address the screen wide, it has to be an object. So in, in this case, I want to keep the tambourine at the screen wide. Now, I know what we're all thinking. A tambourine has transients. Wouldn't that make a timing issue between the channel here and here? Now, what is interesting about this particular tambourine is a, there is movement in the tambourine. And if there's movement, it is not going to smear a lot. It's not the same as placing something here. No. If it's here, it'll come in, it'll come out only from that speaker. And, you know, in Atmos, it's going to sound brilliant uh, because there is nothing to be time aligned between this because it's an individual speaker. You know, the timing issue happens if this comes from here and here, which we're not going to do because we have speaker snap on. And this is how it would sound. You can see it come out from 25, 26, and you can see the positioning. Now, one thing to notice is I have a ride on my percussion pack here, and the tambourines were going to this bus. Now, because I've sent it out of an object, it is no longer going to this bus. So what I have to do is I have to copy this automation and keep it there just so that it follows the same ride. So that's what the percussions do. So once we've done with the percussions, um, again, uh, we've, got, we've got a rhythm loop here. And... On the rhythm loop, it's basically a very high um, attack. And you have... Now, in this portion, I use the, you know, the, the very uh, well-known technique that we've seen a lot, which is um, panning. So if, if we listen to this entire thing in context, So you can hear that um, a bit more with, with a bit more prominence, you know, with a bit of that movement as well. It actually becomes much more beautiful because of the movement and because I'm not pushing things. Um, I don't want to you know, bump up a lot of things in terms of just level. Um, you know, you have to be smart about levels as well. And the whole idea is not about pushing things. It's about creating a space because the reason you push something is because it's probably not heard. And if it's probably not heard, it's probably clashing with something else um, as well. If it's clashing with something else, you need to figure out a way to, you know, kind of uh, give it a movement or make an EQ or a compression and, and you know, proceed in, in that term. So 
this is one of the tricks that I do because there are, in in my opinion, there are three ways you can get dynamics in a mix: um, frequency, volume, and positioning. So the next thing is the is the bass. Um, uh, the bass again, it's it's a. I just have a pretty small EQ you know, that's there, and I also use the. Um, the Acme Opticon. Uh, this is a trick that I learned from um, Farhad, who's a brilliant, who's another brilliant engineer as well. So, um, so this is how it sounds without the Opticon. Again, this is from Plugin Alliance, another beautiful, beautiful plugin. You can, you can just hear the attitude come up. I wanted to be able to accentuate uh, some of the movements that he's done um, in, in the playing as well, rather than leave it completely static. Again, when you create these slight um, movements, you know, you create space and you you make sure that these things are heard within the mix um, as well. So for the bass is one of the you know, ones where, you know, where I wanted to make sure that the subtlety was heard. And, you know, it, there's, there's a complete ride over the bass as well. So if you listen to the bass, you know, in conjunction with the, um, with the percussion, uh, with the kick and, you know, the snare and all of those things, all of those as well, you can see how it sounds as well. Those, those slight uh, um, slides just giving it like a little bit of bump and you know rides and all of that as well the the none of these instruments uh, had their rides uh, you know I didn't do any of the rides in solo all of these rides and all of these processes that you hear are done after playing back the track so Usually, uh, my method is once I get the tracks and once I arrange them, I just hit the space bar to see what's in there and it just plays off. Uh, I make my slight mental notes, I make my fader levels and all of that just to get it in the ballpark of where I think uh, it does not have a lot of clashes. And then, and only then, do I start with EQ. And most of my EQs are usually corrective EQs. While corrective EQs are good, you also have to be careful to not take away the meat of the song. You know, a lot of times when we start doing all of these corrective EQs, I used to do this mistake a lot. Um, make sure you do these EQs in context with the other thing. You know, you want to be able to tell if, okay, um, so if you were a bass player and, you know, if someone sings a song, at what point would you kind of accentuate his or his singing or accentuate the music a bit? That's kind of what you do with every element in, in the mix. And... The way you do that is not in solo. You listen to each of these elements. You pick out how they want to interact with each other, tell a story. Because this is a story of a lot of people. You know, you have the bass guitar, you have the strings, you have the pads, you have the vocals, the percussion. This is a story of a lot of people. And you want every person to play their role in this. So um, so that's, that's one thing about the bass guitar. And if you notice, the bass guitar is again panned pretty close to where the kick is. So if I just solo the bass and percussions so we're here and we listen to this so you can see where the kick kind of falls off from not being a part of of the percussion of you know it kind of stands out so i start building uh, these these subtle relationships, these subtle conversations between um, these instruments. Now, you know, when when I started um, learning about mixing and you hear these things of, you know, make the instruments talk to each other, you know, they should tell a story. It's very hard initially, even for me, it was very hard to understand what exactly is that, you know, how how does that translate into a fader? How does that translate into anything, you know, on the track? How do I tell a story? What do you mean by telling a story? So, for example, if you have a weak section here, who covers for that? You know, if you're if you're playing as a team, you have a weak player. Or if someone's someone has a strength in something and you know, a weakness in something else, you get other people to cover for that. 
it's the same thing. If this is weak, you get something else to cover for that. That is the story. All of the techniques that are applied actually come out of the need for the interaction. So, you know, a good example is, let's say, let's take the case of the strings, for example. Now, so you, I, this track is a duplicate of this track. Now, what do I have on this is, this is, the, this is a string as it is. You know, there's no processing that's done on that. What I've done is I've duplicated this track. Now on that, I have um, a little radiator from Sound Toys. So basically what I've done is I've done a bit of harmonic processing on that. Actually, I wouldn't call it a bit. It's fairly mm, a fair bit of harmonic processing. I've used again the Eventai trick on that and I pushed it to rare. And um, with, with half, with slightly more than 50% of a mix. And that is to make sure that these two um, sounds, although are similar, they're not exact in waveform. You know, it's it's called decorrelation. You know, they sound similar, but they're not exactly the same waveform that is being when you play them back. Uh, when you decorrelate something, you uh, you have the advantage of adding a bit more space to it, a bit more um, separation in in that. Um, and you have to be very careful of how you decorrelate. Um, so one of the techniques that I use is a lot of harmonic processing reverbs. Now, when I say reverbs. Um, it's very subtle. They're not, they would be like, in terms of wetness, it would be like around five or so, 5% 5 wet, you know, slight things like that. And what I've done on this track is I've upmixed the harmonically processed. Now, the way, one of the ways the, uh, the halo upmix works is it looks at prominent frequencies that is there. So if 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 the frequencies are prominent, it pushes it pushes it towards the front. You know, if they if it finds that some of those elements are diffused, it will start pulling it back. Now, by introducing harmonic processing in that, I'm changing the relationship of what was prominent before. You know, I have much more signals now that are more diffused. So which means I can actually easily fill my surrounds in a way that was not possible just by panning. Now, if I play them together you will hear the difference. You know, versus... You can hear how it, how it completes, completely opens up. I couldn't do that with just panning. And the reason, again, these kind of slow... Um, movements are more you know they give you a um, feeling of something as like a warm hug you know and when you have that movement in you know surrounding you because what happens when you when someone hugs you is like you know you you feel covered right and you try to get that kind of um, an expression from this musically and in, in you know this was the only thing that was there so i duplicated this added a bit of harmonic because, you know, I didn't want them to clash and add a bit of reverb and upmixed it. So now I have a perfect hug that is there. And so that's, that's the technique that I used here. Again, that was because, and this stops just before the bass, you know, by the time you have the bass guitar, the panning uh, of of this string has stopped so at the at the bass guitar it's static now because then the conversation is based on levels between the bass guitar and and the strings over there right so we have uh, another set of strings as well um it's um it's a So if you listen to this kind of a tone, you know, you you, you know that the highs and the lows are, uh, are pretty cut as well. And something that's like, really, really um, band limited in that there's no point in giving it a lot of spread. So which is why I anchored it towards the front. So if you look at the spread of the strings in its entirety, uh, just the strings, you will hear, you will actually see how it's spread in, in a 5.1.
So that's how the conversation between the strings and the bass happens. Right. <clears throat> so we've dealt with the piano. Now we've got the roads here. You know, it's the same technique. You have, this was the original roads that was there and it's played. So I duplicated that. I used a bit of um, reverb in this case. Uh, and one of the things I wanted was to spread out um, this this road. Um, and the other thing I did was to add a tremolator to this because I wanted to accentuate the rises and the falls in, in, in the road itself. So you have kind of a sawtooed movement that supports the road as well and the reason I, I had to add this in addition was because the reverbs you know when when you have the reverbs it's it smeared out um, the movement that was there so if, you know if you just you don't hear the the the, the no. I wanted the road to kind of wobble a bit between them uh, but in a subtle in, in a way that you know it would complement the main road now if you listen to this You know, it, it sounds a bit too much, too drastic. But if you listen to this whole element as one element, you get you get the feeling that the attack happens in the front and then the movement moves off in the back. So you have an attack in the movement and an attack in the movement. You can achieve this pretty easily, you know, without using a single fader movement there. So... This is why I duplicated this track so that I get a bit more of, of a movement here. Now, remember, also the other reason why I had the roads already towards the center was at this point, if you remember, you know, we start the piano in the center and then we open up towards the surrounds, right? So at this point, you already have everything in the surrounds. And this is just to add to the fact that, you know, you have a surround experience and then you're you're adding up one more element. If you listen to the piano, um, the strings and the bass... You can hear each one helping the other accentuate. Compositionally, the song has a build-up, but you know these are subtle things that you can add um, as an engineer. Now, the guitars actually have um, a very uh, unique uh, technique that I've used as well. So uh, again, um, I have you know there's literally no processing in this. What I did for the delay was a thing called which which I kind of called up called it as the infinite delay now you can see it 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 rises in in each pluck so so there are two delays that is happening one is the the original guitar verb um, that goes into a delay which is into an echo boy and there is one that i called an infinite delay now, what is the infinite delay? Let me see if I can give you a better example of the infinite delay. So if if I play this pluck. So what happens is, so the way I've built this is, if I show you the mix window, it comes to the left channel, the left feeds the center, the center feeds the right, the right feeds the right surround, the right surround feeds the um, right back, the right back feeds the left back, the left back feeds the left, and the left again feeds the center. So it goes in a circle. Now if I were to show you all of these 
are positioned as objects. So if I play this, you know, you can see that it just continues. So as long as this is near zero, you know, um, the river will, the delay will continue. And I did this just to get um, a more bit of a movement in this because I wanted to accentuate some of the, the single plucks that were there. And in this way, you know, I get a bit more of a movement of the individual plucks in between. And they're also quite random. Because that's the beauty of it, you know, as long as you can't predict that this is going to happen, you know, it keeps you more engaged in the song. Because if you start predicting, it becomes something that is very common. And, you know, when something's really common, your brain just switches off from there. So that's one of the things that I used in the in the guitars as well. Um, again, uh, the same the same technique as well. So I have a high pass on, on a parallel guitar track and band it to the surround. So this is how the entire guitar section feels including if you listen to it with the delay i'll just turn on the uh, the delays as well so you can see those And you can hear that it's it's much more of an ethereal thing, you know. It's 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 just to give a motion, a fluid, a feeling of fluidity in that whole thing, you know, something that's ethereal moving around. And because these are at random positions as well, that's the technique of um, infinite delay that I've used as well. So this this entire thing goes after the delays um, uh, in terms of send. And you can also see that they're not exactly the same levels as well, just to make you know you want to have a bit of the human element in that you know everything is not perfect and it shouldn't be perfect you know when it's not perfect it gives you more of a connection to that if we come down to the synths over here what we have on the synths is this is straight off positioning that's there i use the same technique um so i have a tremulator with a pan man to give a bit of motion towards the, for the synths especially in this region over here that's what I did with the synths and when you when I play this whole section the idea is to make you feel that the synth is one surround element rather than a, a, a mono element. Now if you at this point I have a bit more pan that's happening in the synths. And that's again to give uh, the whole synths a bit more of a motion and you know not really pull you into the fact that look hey i'm doing a whole pan no the idea is, is to get you engaged because at this point you have the climax of the song um getting into the uh, vocals so the vocals have a bit of processing in terms of the reverbs um again uh, uh, these are the reverb eq and on the reverb the, um, the effects track itself, I've done a processing using 7th um, Heaven on that. Uh, another very interesting thing you could use is you could use, for example, Exponential Audio, which is um, Isotope. And what that gives you is you have the Stratus um, sections, which is also a 3D uh, reverb. So you can use, let's say, 7.1 and you can use the remaining two for overheads or you can use it to send it to your sides as well, you know, assign it to an object. Uh, but I, I tend to, I went with, with this particular technique as well. So not a lot of very heavy processing, just a few corrective EQs in this. And this is the vo vocal master chain that I have, you know, it's pretty straightforward. I have a DSO in, in the final uh, uh, output over there. So, and this is what the, this is what the vocals sound like. Piran 
So you will see some subtle rides that are being done on the reverbs as well. That's just to, you know, as uh, it's, it's like the common technique, you know, she starts speaking and then you spread it out and you bring it back just so that, you know, you feel that it's it's a completely ethereal moment. And that's what happens in the vocals over there. Uh, and that's basically the whole thing is the dynamics between the vocals and its reverbs so that, you know, you have a conversation that's kind of happening between this. It feels more spread out you feel a whole ethereal moment you know a very floating movement uh, movement that is there and again that's why the pans are drastically away from the main channel so you kind of take this off and tail it away kind of a thing uh all of these vocals have rides on them as well um, and there's a lot of subtle rides in, in this portion as well because this is the portion where you know a lot of these things have the conversation that I told you about in the beginning. So that's where uh, the vocal rides come in and all of these rides, um, I never never do rides with a mouse. When I was just preparing this one, it was on the S3 and I have an S1 right now. Um, so I always use a fader because I can't get my mouse to do these kind of um, subtle movement. Um, in this one so that's what happens in the vocals you know nothing nothing major it's it's all about how you balance you know, make a make a conversation between this in terms of positioning and in terms of writing the levels as well so for example if i play this section you know if, let's let's just hear everything together you'll hear why these rides exist in in the vocal If you were a singer, these are kind of the exact movements that you would be doing as you sing. You know, you would go front and back. And I wanted to bring that kind of a movement within the song as, as, as well. It adds a bit of dynamics to this, makes it more real, more human, rather than, you know, having the singer, you know, sing straight up into the mic. So that's one of the things that I did over here. Um, coming to the chorus, uh, again, chorus was straight. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a pan that I did over here. You can see uh, I have an automation that happens as well. So it, it shifts from being a bus to an object over here. What I've done in this portion is, so this portion, I wanted the chorus to open up a bit. So rather than simply panning it, I cut off a piece from that, you know, boosted a bit of gain and then put it as an object uh, right up there. So this is how it would sound. Um, this is how the chorus would sound. <laughs> So it's those E's that you hear and you know it's it's basically um, a, a filtered EQ that's going into a reverb and you know slight bit of pan as well you know it's just to get that slight bit of movement over there and all that is there is just So this one, when you add it to the main main chorus that's running. The idea is also that you shouldn't really hear those E's uh, very prominently. Uh, it, it it might feel like that now, but you know, in in the context of the mix, you'll find that it's much more controlled. So 
so um one other thing that i did was as the song progressed um i wanted the song to have a bit more grit uh, in 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 these areas um a bit more uh, i wouldn't say grit as the right word a bit more of um warm than uh, a lot more harmonics in there so what i did was to use parallel processing so i use an spl there's a saturn and there's a fairchild so if i were to play this you know if i just turn off the automation and if i mute that for now versus if i turn it on you can hear the subtle um, cover that it's giving in in towards the low mid regions as well so that's what i wanted to achieve at that point you know just cover the low mids so rather than you know having to eq a bunch of old tracks and figure out where to do what i just have a parallel processing that was running here and then i started writing the faders as well now there's one more technique that i used in in, in this song as was you know as you finish this one and you reach the climax of the song i wanted to have a bit more of um pan uh for the for the choruses and this is what i actually did so if you listen to the way the pan moves in accordance with what is um being sung you know i'm pulling him back on those action accentuated um uh um vocals so where he says the r's and e's and all of that you know you you hear a slight movement that is pretty much exactly the way the words are being sung so if it's andati so you have that slight movement over there so that is basically what my um concept of the song is um and once once we have this built up uh, once you know exactly what you want to do you know, why are these levels being ridden against each other how do you fix the balance between each other where do you use compression where do you use limiters now where do you use an eq why would you use an eq and how would you tell a story once you have that you have a piece of work uh, for you and i'll play the whole song at this point
So there you have it, Andadi from '96 in Dolby Atmos. Um, a huge, huge amount of thanks to Govind um, for this amazing, amazing track. And also, make sure you you subscribe to their channel um, and make sure you listen to the song. This is a brilliant song as well. Uh, you know, as an engineer, I had very little to do in terms of telling the story because by by virtue of creation, it's it's a beautiful song. Um, I hope you learn some of the techniques that I use in my mix and I employ in in doing this. It's just so that you have a starting point or you have um, an inspiration uh, or you get an idea from something uh, that was done and you build up upon that. Uh, just so that we can have an amazing, amazing world of a lot of techniques, a lot of beautiful mixes that tell you the story. Stay safe. I'm signing off. Cheers.